Greetings and salutations, and thanks for hanging out with me for a while. In this video, we are going to take a look at BU, which is short for backup. It is a bash script that makes taking incremental style snapshot backups of your Debian and Ubuntu based systems super easy. This works on Debian, Ubuntu, anything based on it, like Linux Mint, MX Linux, Elementary OS, Pop OS. KDE Neon, Zorin, Peppermint, whatever it is you got. If it's Ubuntu or Debian based, this should work just fine. This is a replacement for XBT. XBT is a similar program that I have been working on for the last two or three years. Those of you who have followed the channel for a long time will know that we've talked a lot about it in videos in the past. Many of you have been very kind to download and use it yourself and give me a lot of great user feedback and BU comes from that feedback and it's not that people didn't like XBT they just had some problems with the way that it worked and to tell you the truth so did I we'll talk more about that later on in the video when we get into looking at the code and the theory of operations if you want to continue to use XBT you like it there's no reason why you should not use it you can keep on using it for quite some time it's just that it is now in archive mode which means that you can still download it from github you may fork it if you like if you are into bash scripting yourself but i will no longer be maintaining it however i don't see any reason why xbt should not continue to work on ubuntu and debian for a very long time to come very astute viewers will note that this is take two of a video about BU. We posted another one earlier that had to be taken down for issues. I'll tell you about that later in the video. Right now, let's get into the meat of the deal here. We're going to learn how to get set up, but first I want to talk a bit about why backups are important and why I have written backup software the way I have and how it works. So you got to back up your stuff, folks. It is very important. You can lose your data forever for any number of reasons. It, it happens instantaneously. So we have software crashes on the list, hardware, hardware failures, uh, drives can just die. It doesn't matter whether it's a new drive or a drive you've been running for a while. It doesn't matter whether it's SSD or M2 or flash drive that you're pulling in and out of the machine. It makes no difference. They can just die suddenly for no apparent reason. Lightning strikes close to your house. doesn't even have to be that it strikes your house itself. And you get an electromotive pulse, which induces a bunch of electricity in the circuitry in your computer, and it fails. It happens all the time. Or you just type in the wrong command. A couple of weeks ago, I did that. I'm like, working on this thing and I just typed in this command and I didn't realize it and on this machine that I was working on I blew out the entire home directory just poof it was gone that fast and there you go so having a backup is very important an ounce of prevention is worth 10 tons of cure especially if you're dealing with things that you want to keep like oh your music collection your pictures or your work files whatever you want to make sure that you have them backed up somewhere a good backup solution is simple, reliable, accurate, and most of all, portable, which means that you have access to that data. A lot of programs that you can use to backup have a fatal flaw, and that is the only way to actually restore the data is to use the program that you use to create the backup because it is put in some proprietary format. And that is a bad thing. What if you don't have access to that program? What if you want to move that data from one computer to another that have different operating systems? So there's all kinds of reasons that that's not cool. Another thing that a lot of backup software will let you do is create backups and then put a password on it for security. Well, that's awesome. You can encrypt it, right? What if you forget the password? Or what if that becomes corrupt and you can't get to your data? useless completely absolutely so when I write backup software and I've been doing this for about 10 years I used to do things for Windows before I did it for Linux I always made sure that it was stored in such a way that I could just plug the drive in look at it pull out a file a directory change something whatever in the backup if I want to so that's what this does and finally you should store your backups on a device that isn't installed in the computer or always hooked up to it why See the part up there about lightning strikes. 
or power supply failures. If your power supply dies in just the right way in your computer, it can send all kinds of funky voltages into everything that's plugged into it, and it'll fry every device that's hooked up to the computer, including USB. So you want to have that drive unpluggable. That's why it, we're going to use a USB drive. Some people have a RAID system on their computer, which means that they have either like RAID 1, where they have two hard drives and they're mirrored, and they think, well, I don't need a backup because I have redundant data. Or you might, you might have RAID 5, which has an array of drives, and there's a lot of parity there. You can pull a drive out and put another one in, and it'll rebuild. Great. Guess what? That's still not a backup. That's redundant data on the machine. The same thing that happens to a plugged-in USB drive can happen to a RAID ses setup just as easily. Lightning strikes, power supply fails, gone. The RAID system itself becomes a point of failure as well. What if the RAID controller dies? Nothing wrong with the drives, nothing wrong with the system. You just now all of a sudden can't access it. And that's because the RAID controller dies. Sometimes you can get another RAID controller and put it in. Sometimes it puts out a bunch of garbage and it kills your drives. You never know. So do backups regardless of your storage. And I am saying this because, and taking the time to say this, because a lot of people don't know this or they think they're doing enough and they're not doing enough. You really need a backup that is backing up everything in a secure and reliable and accurate way. A lot of people think that a backup is sticking another drive in their computer. Maybe they'll go so far as to set up a cron job to copy data into that backup drive. Well, if the power supply goes or lightning, that's it. And a lot of people say, well, I've got some of it on a thumb drive over here and I've backed up some of the crap on another drive over here and they don't have it all in one place and if they should have to restore it, it becomes a nightmare because now they're searching around for their data so wanted to make sure I pointed that out to use BU the first thing that you're going to have to do is set it up we're going to do uh, in a virtual machine today I'm going to show you how to run the program but before we get to that what we're going to need to do is we're going to need to create a BU drive. So we're going to show you how to do that. Creating a BU drive is actually quite simple. There's very few requirements. You can use any tool that you would like to do this. We're going to use disks in our demonstration today. You could use Gparted. You could do it from a command line. If you're running Linux Mint, there's a nifty little tool in there that does this pretty much automatically. But you are going to have to do it before you can use the program. So the first thing that we need to do is to plug our drive in. In this case, we're going to use a 64 gigabyte flash drive, and that'll be fine to back up the home directory on our VM. There's not a whole lot in there. You can use any drive you want to, as long as there's enough capacity on it to store all the data that you want to back up from the various systems that you'll be using BU on. You can do more than one computer with BU, so therefore make sure there's plenty of space. Some people have really big drives, like big four terabyte drives that they have uh, hooked up to USB and if that's the case you may want to have other partitions on the drive in you know like right next to your backup partition that's fine no problem BU will just look for this particular partition and it will take off and and use it, it even if there's others on the drive so this is a blank drive so the first thing we need to do is format the disk if you had used your drive for something else like maybe you used it to install a Linux distribution, you got an ISO file burn onto it or something like that, then you're going to have to clear the drive off. So the first thing that you want to do is create a new partition table on the drive. And you can use good old MS-DOS MBR or you could use GPT. doesn't matter. It's entirely up to you. We're just going to go with good old MS-DOS and we're going to say, yes, please go ahead. And now it is going to create the partition table. It'll take it just a second to do so. And then we will be able to add our first partition. So it is doing that and it's ready to go. And now what we're going to do is create a partition on that drive. So we'll go next. We're going to use the whole space of the drive. I'm not going to create another partition. That's where uh, with disks that you could do that if you wanted to. So the label is very important. It must be capital BU underscore capital D lowercase r i v e. That is exactly what it's going to look for. If it doesn't see that, 
it's not going to find it. We must use a Linux native file system. That is very important. Do not try and do this with NTFS, VFAT, FAT32, something that's compatible with Windows and Mac. You want to have a Linux native system, and in the case of disks, that will default to ext4, which is perfectly all right. No problem there. So it has been created, and we could mount that from here if we wanted to. Let's go ahead and do that like so and yes it finds it so let's double click here and see what we get and we have an empty space and that's what we want that's all we need to have to make this work and I'm gonna go ahead and close this and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna unplug the drive and I'm gonna plug it back in to reset it because I wanna give you a little bonus here if you are using ext4 there are other file systems that are Linux native like XFS, BTRFS, stuff like that but if you are using ext4, then you're probably going to want to reclaim the reserve space. When ext4 is formatted, it automatically sets aside 5% of the space and it makes it only available to the system, or the kernel actually. And the reason why it does that is because if you're going to boot from this drive, then there is a possibility that you could totally run out of space. You could have a program go crazy, take up all the drive, and if there's no space for the kernel to work, then it'll crash. Well, on a storage drive like this, or even if you have a separate home partition, you have a boot partition and you have a home partition, you don't need to have this reserved. It's not booting from it. So you can get that space back. And 5% doesn't sound like much, but if you're doing this on... A, several terabyte drive that's a lot of space that you can't get to so I'm going to show you how to get to that and it's actually a really simple command it is tune to FS and then the option is M we're going to choose zero for our reserve space and uh, we are going to uh, first of all let's find out exactly where a drive is I already know but in case you don't know we need to take this step so you need to know where your drive is in the system let's make that a little bit smaller that's going to be too big there. Uh, there we go. Okay, so let's run ls block. And you can see that we have our BU drive here and it is uh, SDC, which is what we needed to know. So now we use this command. Uh, we're going to do dev, which is the device directory where all of the drives appear. And then we'll do SDC1. Okay, and now what this should do is. Uh, well, you have to do it as sudo. <laughs> there you go. Let's try this again. All right, yes, you have to do it with uh, those privileges. Now we have that space reclaimed, okay? If you are doing this on a drive that you boot off of, let's say that you have a couple of terabyte spinning drive and you're booting the system off of it as well in the system and all of your files live in it at the same time then you can do the same command but now we can reduce that space to one so we're setting aside one percent for the kernel to work with that's a lot better than five okay gang so now we have our drive all set up and ready to rock and roll let's jump into our VM over here and then we will go through how the program works so let's grab our device and plug it in in a virtual machine. This is how you do it. And it should pop up. And that's ready to rock and roll. So now the next thing that we need to do is we need to actually go get BU script and put it someplace where we can use it. So we'll open up the Firefox web browser here. There it goes. And to get to it, just go to easylinux.com. Okay, and once we're here, we go to bash scripts. I got it blown up real big for you guys who are looking from those small resolution devices. I know how that is when you're watching a YouTube video on your phone or your tablet. So, if you come to this page and scroll down, it's like the first thing here. It's the USB backup tool. And uh, this video will end up here embedded, but it's not there now because I haven't made the video yet. We're working on it right now. Uh, which came first, the video or the post? You know, that's <laughs> one of those kind of deals. 
you know, chicken or the egg thing. So we're just going to download it from here. You could go to the uh, GitHub page if you wanted to and take a look around. We're going to save the file. And that should be here because it's really actually a very tiny, tiny, tiny file. This, this program is very small. So what we want to do is go to the home directory and we want to go to downloads and we see that it's there and we double click on that zip file right there and now you see that it's opened up to that directory and there are three little files in there we have BU we have license and a readme file the one we're interested in is BU you just throw it on the desktop if you have an active desktop for now uh, the license is um, GPL 2.0 same as the Linux kernel and the readme just contains uh, some basic directions on how to do this so we can go ahead and close the archive manager yes you can hang on to this if you want to you can put it anywhere you like if you want to keep that in your documents or whatever somebody sent me an email this morning and said do I need to keep that well you don't need to but if you want to you can it's no big deal so now where do we put this to make it work well where I like to put it is in my personal bin directory in my home directory and the way it works with Ubuntu and Debian systems is that if you create this little directory called bin and you throw it in here and then you log in and log out this becomes the first place that your system looks for programs so when you execute a command at the terminal it will look here first and this is where you put your own personal stuff, your own scripts. Maybe you've compiled some software from source. Uh, maybe you've just downloaded bits and pieces. You want to put them here instead of have the package manager take care of them. This is where it would be. If you want to install this software in a place where everybody can use it, then what you would do is you would put it in a directory called slash user usr slash local slash bin that is where software goes that is not managed by the package manager so if it's not a snap package a flat pack or just a regular old deb package that's where you put software like that that's where it goes and uh, that's perfectly all right it just means that everybody will have access to it on the system so once you do that it should be ready to rock and roll now some folks have an issue where it doesn't find their bin directory I'm going to show you how to fix that after we go through the program here so just hang out if that's something that's happened to you in the past and you go oh, I can't put it there I'm gonna to try to tell you a little bit about how that works so now that we have that in there let's go ahead and open up a terminal and make it real big for everybody to be able to see and to run the program plug in the BU drive it's already done it's formatted it's ready to go it says it's mounted you can see it on the desktop we're good to go and then type in BU that's it and then once you do that type in your password and it takes off and it does a backup it does all of this automatically this is automatable you can make it part of a script if you should choose to leave a USB device plugged in uh, as I told you you really should remove that USB device but if you want to do it that way you can a lot of people said I'd like to be able to do it this way so there it is you can do it that way if you like It's not gonna take it very long there's not a whole lot of data on this system what it's doing now is it is taking the data which is sitting in memory and it is making sure that it gets written to the drive and sometimes when you're doing backups especially if you are doing a backup uh, after you've done the first backup you'll notice that it'll go whoop, and it's like oh I'm done but then you'll notice it's taking some time to sync that's perfectly normal just kick back and wait for it to get done now as far as backup times are concerned if you have a lot of data on your computer let's say that your home directory has two or three hundred gigabytes of data in it and you're using a USB 2.0 machine and you have a USB drive plugged into it you're looking at two or three hours for the first backup to take place however once that is done what this is going to do now is it'll only update that backup with what's changed so if you've created files since the last backup deleted some files 
then what it's going to do is it's going to move the new files or the changed files over if you modify a file and then it's going to go through the backup directory and anything that you have deleted on the master or the source is going to be deleted on the backup as well that's called a snapshot style backup that's what that is so every time you take a backup it's creating an exact snapshot which is exactly what you want it to do and once you have everything all backed up the next time around it only takes it a few seconds to do that it, from this point forward uh, doing a backup would only be just a few seconds on this machine so it all depends on how much changes so now we have our backup so let's go see what we have on the BU drive so we have on the BU drive a directory now called BU I got two of them I only need one thank you and let's open that up now you see we have the host name here so if I was going to take this drive and now go plug it into another machine I can back up that machine and it will be kept separate here once you go in there you're going to see you have two directories the first one is etc which is your Etsy directory or etc directory on your Linux system this is a system directory that contains a lot of configuration files and it's good to keep a backup of this. It, this helps you to be able to rebuild a Linux system very quickly because then you can put configurations back in the new system once it's reinstalled and things like SSH keys and stuff like that. Now, if you're not real hip on that and you just want to keep backups of your data, don't worry about it. This is not taking up that much space. You can just ignore it. But let's look in the home directory and you will see that we have my directory. That's my personal home directory right there Joe for my account if I had more than one account on this machine you would see it here now I can click in here and I can go in let's look in the bin directory and look at that there are the actual files which I have access to and I can copy and move around and do whatever I want to do if I need to uh, actually get into the backup and do something also here in my directory and this is just as important I think is we have uh, let's get right there let's see if we we hit control H so we can see hidden stuff you notice that all my configuration files for this system are here as well so there's my configuration files for Thunderbird for instance all my email settings that's where they are so that is all being tracked and taken care of every time I do a backup it's being snapshotted that's awesome so that's the first feature of BU now there is a restore function that is built into this and it's really for emergencies only and what this is here for is if you run into a situation where you have to restore the data back onto your machine from a backup and you're not sure what got deleted uh, you're not sure where it all needs to go so you can do it all in one shot and that's what this does now Restore is a little bit wonky. It's a it's kind of a dangerous process. You have to be careful with it. And it will only work if the machine that you're backing up to has exactly the same host name. Also, it helps if your user accounts match up. Your username and user ID. Now, technically speaking, you should be able to back up even if it doesn't. But what's going to happen is, is that you may lose everything in your home directory for your user it might get screwed up so only do it on machines that you know for a fact you have the same user ID the same username and the same host name uh, for instance would be let's say that your hard drive crashes and then you have to put a new drive in and you reinstall Linux and then you have to go back and you want to put all your data back well you can do this just make sure that you create the same username Make sure that the machine has exactly the same host name and then you can just run restore and it'll put it all back. But mainly this is for an existing system that you've just done something stupid and you want to put everything back the way it was. So in order to do that we run BU and then we put in restore as an option. This cannot be automated. It's going to ask you, do you really want to do this? Yes, I do. So say yes. Well, actually, I hit the wrong key. So it canceled. That's okay. It shows you how that works. Let's do that one more time. Let's hit the anything but the lowercase y is going to cause the system to bounce out of there, which is good. So yes, I'm committed now. I really need to do this. Hit 
any key and go forward. Now, any applications that are running in the background, if you're continuing to play a game or you have a web browser open, it it's, could potentially cause errors uh, because then files change before they get backed up uh, or rather restored and it gets weird. So you don't want to do that. You want to make sure that you have as, all your applications closed. And if you get an error again, then you need to run this twice until you don't get any errors. And then you can then restart the system. So that didn't take any time at all simply because of the fact that uh, we didn't change anything. <laughs> if there were some changes that had happened since the last backup, then there you go. Uh, also keep in mind this does blow away any new stuff that you saved since the last time that you did a backup. So if you have pictures, files, emails, whatever that have come down since then, they go poof. So that's why it's very cautious and it stops you and asks you and makes sure you want to do it. So the next function here is pretty simple. It's just the help page and that's it. It opens up uh, in less, which is the utility that we're using to display it. And to get out of it, you press Q and it throws you back at the command line. So that is the simple operation of this. That's just as simple as it can be. And those of you who have used XBT in the past will know that we have taken a lot of the original functions of XBT on that menu out of here simply because people didn't use them. And we'll talk more about that in just a few moments. So let's talk about errors and troubleshooting, what might be going wrong here. So if I type BU and get my uh, argument wrong, just put some garbage in there. Uh, it's going to tell us that we need to, you know, put in something that works, and it's going to remind us that we need to read help, maybe. So that's nice. Another pitfall about the way this program works is that some of you may be tempted to try and run it as sudo bu. Well, first of all, if it's in your local bin directory, it's not going to work at all because when you run something with sudo privileges, you're running as root. You're not running out of root's bin directory. You're running out of yours, so it can't find it. And what will happen then, even if I can, I can fool this and I can tell it exactly where the program is with that little add-on. I'm just saying, here, run this program that's in home directory bin. Now watch this. It'll find the program, but you're going to get an error. Do you see that? And one of the errors is, is that you shouldn't run this with sudo. And the reason why is because... Once again, when you run things as sudo, you're running as the root user. And when you plug this drive in and you're the one logged in, it's going to hook up to your user account. So you can't launch it with sudo privileges. So uh, that is that. Uh, when you are done doing a backup with BU, you will notice that it tells you that it is safe to remove the drive. It is actually safe to yank it out right now because once you sync it, it's okay. However, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and use the safely remove option. Okay? So you want to make sure that uh, you do that twice. If you don't, it's not that big a deal. That's the point of syncing, to make sure all the data gets written to the drive. But most people will probably go ahead and use the safely remove or eject the way they're supposed to. And that's just a double whammy. It makes sure that everything is where it should be. But actually, you can pull it. It'll probably be okay. So that is the basic operation of BU. Now let's talk a little bit about what happens if you create your bin directory and you can't find your bin directory. And I'll just show that to you here. So let's go ahead and clear the screen. So how that works is this. If you go and you look at a file that is in your user directory and it's called profile, you're going to see that you have some commands here. And the first thing that it's going to do uh, is it's going to try and find your .bashrc file. You see that right there? That's what that does. It looks for a file called .bashrc. That's your own personal bash settings file. If it finds it, it's going to load it. And then the very next thing it's going to do is it's going to look and see if you have that bin directory right there. You see that? And if it exists, then it's going to add that to the path. Now here's what can happen sometimes. If you have a setting in your bash directory that hangs up, 
this part of the script never gets executed. All right. They also have an option here where you can put it in home.local.bin if you want to. Uh, I don't do that, but obviously that's available if you want to do it. So what you would need to do if for some reason you find that this isn't working, and I found this in Debian is a problem. Uh, MX Linux, for instance, this seems to be a problem. So what you want to do is copy this little chunk of code right here, and then you want to use, we'll use nano, so we're going to do nano dot bash rc like so and this will open up our bash rc file and all we want to do is take that little thing that for some reason is not executing the first time around and we'll stick it down here at the bottom see right there so that will make sure that that gets run before the bash rc is, is done executing. So control O to save and control X. And there is no problem whatsoever of having two of them. If it catches it the first time, it'll just do it again. It's no big deal. Uh, that way that makes that reliable and it actually works. That's the that's what I have found that makes that work. So that is really all there is to running this program. Super easy to use, very reliable and it will create backups on a lot of machines. So what we're going to do now is we're going to actually look at the code and we'll talk about the theory of operations. This is always my favorite part of these videos because if you have watched this far and if you're going to hang around you're a real nerd and you're into this stuff and I get to talk about how it works. So before we jump into looking at the code specifically, a couple of things that I want to say. First of all, yes, there was another video that was posted like this that had to be taken down. The reason why is because there were some misspellings in the error messages for this script. And there were more of them than I had anticipated when I started doing the video. What happened was is that I had a couple of people proofread it and they missed it and then I took some out and then I actually ended up not saving them in the right place I had two copies of the script going at once and so the one that ended up in the video was the one that had like all the errors in it it was actually like a rough draft so everybody was pointing out well that's spelled wrong and that's spelled wrong in the comments now that is on one hand helpful because it helped me to realize that something went wrong and that I was actually looking at the wrong copy and posted the wrong copy on GitHub by the way but it also becomes a pain in the ass because people feel it necessary to do that all the time so then you get a comment section that's just full of people going Haha, you mistyped that or you had a typo I call those folks the typo police and so this script has been gone through with a fine tooth comb. As far as I know, everything is the way it should be. If you do see something that isn't right, you can go ahead and post it and I will address it, but I will most likely delete your comment. I'm just letting you know, nobody's perfect and I'm bad about finding misspellings anyway. I look at this stuff all the time and you know when you're working on it you look at it for so long that it just looks right it's you miss stuff so that's what the deal was with that okay but we are looking at it now and this is the new and improved version so let's get into the theory of operations and how it works so the first thing that happens is we got to tell you all about it so we have all the little information up top that you know it's the GPU GPL license and when it was created and the version number and all that whatever um, so then the first thing that we're going to do in the script is declare static variables, which means that I'm going to grab some of the shell variables, which is uh, the username and the host name variable, and I'm going to put it in a local variable for the script. I have found this to be more robust than just calling it from the shell. Sometimes you get some strange results, and I don't know why. So just go ahead and grab those. Uh, the host name is used to identify the computer that we are going to be using uh, to get the backup from and also to create the directory on the backup drive. Uh, somebody said in a comment that really they thought that this was not the best way to go because somebody could have two computers on the same network named Ubuntu. 
I, I don't know about that. Uh, they said that maybe you could use the machine ID, which lives in the Etsy directory. That wouldn't work because it would destroy portability, and that's just a number anyway. It's like, uh, uh, it's no, that this is easy. This is the simplest way to do this, is just use the host name. So that's why this is chosen. If somebody has a problem with their host names, or uh, somebody, the person said, what if they changed their host names? People don't change their host names on that computer very often. And if they are smart enough to figure out how to do that, then they're probably smart enough to know that they're going to have to redo their backup. So let's keep it simple. Uh, the next part that we roll into here is where we're going to check and make sure that Less and RSync are installed on the machine before the script goes any further. These are the two utilities that absolutely must be there. Both of those are POSIX standard Linux things that should be installed on any Debian or Ubuntu system. However, weird things do happen and they get removed for some reason or the other and people don't know it or just any strange stuff can happen. So this makes sure that they are there. It does not prompt the user and tell them to install it. It just does it. It just asks for the password, the pseudo password, and then it just installs it. It's supposed to be there anyway. It's important for the script to run. And yeah, I could have put bigger if statements in here that alert people and say, oh, you need to install this. But honestly, a lot of the people who end up using these kind of software, that would just confuse them. It's supposed to be there anyway. We'll install it from the uh, apt package repositories. That's the standard repositories. And we'll go on with life. So next we're going to declare our functions or set the functions. Functions are like commands that you create within a script that are used within that script and they're very powerful because the way it works is that your your functions are read into memory before you get to the execution part of the script and it makes things run very quickly and very logically. I mean you may be familiar with scripts that the way it works is that it's one command after another what we're doing here is we are loading everything into memory first and it, it really makes it so you can be very flexible about how it's executed especially when you need to repeat a function again and again and you'll see that when we get down to the execute section so the first thing that we need to do is test for the drive so this if statement right here tests for any USB drive any of them right there and if there's no USB drive plugged into the machine, then it tells somebody there's, uh, you know, no drive plugged in at all. So what you have to do is is uh, plug in a drive or, uh, you know, you can learn more about drive setup here. Give people a gentle nudge. Go read the help page. And this is if there's no drive plugged in at all. It'll just go, you, you forgot to plug in the drive. So if it gets through that test, the next test that it goes to is it's looking for uh, a drive that has the BU error, uh, uh, the, the BU drive on it. So there's no USB drive with a partition labeled BU drive. That just means you have USB drives plugged in, but we couldn't find the partition, and uh, it's not ready for use with BU. So once again, uh, you know, we make sure that tell people don't launch BU as root or with sudo BU, and then once again we'll tell them to check help for the setup instructions now that's the first function so if that goes through just fine that passes that test uh, great nobody even knows what's going on the next function is backup and this is where stuff actually happens the first thing that we need to do is check for pseudo privileges we need to make sure that the person running the script uh, goes ahead and turns on sudo turns on the sudo timer so that all of the functions that are coming up next will run without prompting and with no issues. Um, so the way I do that is to just do sudo ls, which is a very basic command, and then we take the output to that and throw it into dev null. And what that does is just runs the command and that turns on the sudo timer. Next thing that's going to run here is uh, we need to change the ownership of the partition to the person using it. This is important that this happens every time. If for some reason you have different user accounts, you want to use the same drive, this allows you to do that. And each uh, directory that is created for the machine will be uh, the user, it will belong to the user that 
is on that machine. Now, like on all of my machines, I have the same user ID and the same user name. So I really don't need to do this, but you may have other people with privileges that for some reason need to do this, so that's why it does it. The next thing that it does is it creates machine-specific directories, which means this is where we actually create the uh, BU drive directory and or the BU backups directory and then the host name. And the reason why it is done here and not done later on is because that way it sets up the rsync command so it will run properly. And uh, the make dir with the p option here just means that if that already exists, it doesn't exit with an error. It doesn't say it already exists. That means, oh, it's fine. That directory is already there. So it only creates the directory if it needs to. Now we have a very simple if statement that checks to make sure that that make dir command exited with a zero, which is... Uh, an exit code that tells it, hey, everything's perfectly all right. And if it is, it'll say done. It says the BU drive is ready. That means we have gone through all of those hoops, and now we can actually take a backup. Now, if for some reason or another it cannot create that directory, then an error will come up, and it'll let you know that it couldn't create the directory. And I don't think anybody is ever going to see this error, because that means that something would have had to have happened between checking for ownership and then creating the directory. However, you might have a hardware, a hard drive issue or a hardware issue and it can't write to it. So that's what that's there for. I doubt you'll ever see that particular error code. So once that's done, the next thing we're going to do is do our backup. We're using the rsync utility to do that. And we are using the flags A, which means archive. It means it pulls everything from the original uh, directories exactly as is, maintains timestamps, file attributes, all that kind of stuff. Delete tells it to delete anything that is left over in the backup directory that's not in the source directory. The info progress 2, this is the rsync mode that just shows you the overall progress. Uh, the XBT program had this set up where it would scroll the files up the screen, which I thought was pretty groovy. But some people didn't like that because if they did a backup and then walked away from it, people could walk up and see what their files were. And also, it made it to where it put out a lot of output. It was hard to deal with. I uh, was looking for a simple way to grab that output and put it in a window or maybe reduce it to like 10 lines or something like that. And I really couldn't come up with anything that didn't involve a lot of extra code and calling on other utilities. So this was the quickest solution. This will just give you a basic uh, progress of what's going on and give you some idea that the program is working. So then we grab the ETC and the home directories off the host machine, and then we throw them onto media, user, BU drive, and uh, then it goes to the host. There you go. So uh, that is where the drive will automatically mount. If you plug it in, in Ubuntu and Debian, it will go under media slash user. That's your username, and then BU drive, and so therefore it'll put it right there. When it is done, it will look, once again, we have an if statement that looks to see what the exit code of rsync is. If it's zero, that means there was no errors. And if that's the case, then the first thing it does is clear accidental output. Uh, sometimes it takes quite a while for these backups to happen. And your cat may walk across the keyboard or you may accidentally press some keys. And so this kind of grabs it and it throws it into a variable called discard, which will just disappear when the script exits it'll just go away and I wrote I, I started adding that in simply because of the fact that my cat did walk across the keyboard one day while I was testing the old XBT program and I learned that that's a pretty cool thing to do so once it does that it lets us know that we're all back up and we do the syncing of the drives and uh, you'll see that it says sync uh, that command basically just tells the kernel Hey, write all of the data that's in the memory to the drive, please, so I can yank it out of the system without losing anything. Thank you. And so we want to make sure we do that. And then when it's done, it tells you that it's done. And then it tells you it's safe to remove the USB drive. If there are errors, then it tells you there were errors. Try running the command again to correct them. Now, sometimes the errors that you get 
are pretty frivolous. It could be that you had a file, uh, uh, you had a, a, a web browser open, it said file manager, and you were playing around on the internet and then you had cache files that were created in there and it doesn't know what to do with them. The rsync command sees that files vanished or something like that. And you get a little funky error. That's not going to be fatal, but I don't like to make backups with any errors. So what this does is it just prompts you to do it again. The old XBT program was actually set up in such a way that it would try and run it again. If it caught an error, it would actually loop back around and do the command again. And that was kind of cool in some ways, but it was bad in others because what it would do is it would hang up the system. If the pseudo timer was off, it would prompt you for pseudo privileges once again. And so people that thought they had a backup would come and see that their system was hanging up asking for input. And so therefore I just reduced, I just got rid of that. Now it's just a message. You want to run it again, fine. You want to accept the backup as is, you can do that. It's leaving it up to the user. So then we have uh, the restore function here. And we'll talk about that in just a second. First, I want to talk a little bit about this rsync command and address an issue. There have been people uh, throughout the life of XBT that have come and said that they really would like to have the ability to exclude certain directories in their home directory. Like, for instance, they might have a directory full of virtual machines, or some people want to get rid of their caches and stuff like that. I have not included that here. I do not intend to include that here because excluding directories causes problems for the restore function. Anything that you exclude and you say or tell rsync don't back up is simply not going to appear in the backup. So what's going to happen is, is when you run a restore function and you need to put everything back the way it was, it will completely delete those on the source machine, the home directory during the resource. Uh, restore. So that might not be a big issue if you just tell it not to back up a cache, but people tend to not really know what it is they need to keep or not keep, honestly. And so therefore they end up losing stuff or stuff quits working because they, they have settings in there they didn't know about, that sort of thing. The safest way to go is to create a backup of everything in the home directory. And yes, that includes caches and trash cans. Those are part of the file systems. Those are part of your user's data environment. Some people put things in the trash they want them to be in the trash. If you're using this on a system that has several users, you need to respect that. And, you know, I mean, we all want everything to be nice and clean and efficient and all that stuff. But some people carry it to an extreme. If you want to add an exclude function to this, there's plenty of room on this line to do it. You want to do that, knock yourself out. I won't be held responsible for the results if you use the restore function. Just letting you know, and I don't intend on adding that. My strategy is to back up everything. Storage space is cheap these days, really cheap. So why bother, you know? Yes, I even back up uh, browser caches. So if I have to do a restore, I go back to a state that is somewhere where it needs to be, and the browser's not sitting there going, asking me for you know, permission for cookies or prompting me for passwords every time. So that's the way I look at that. All right, let's go to the restore function. And basically, it's rsync in reverse. It's the same command, but we're going the other direction. So the first thing that it does is it checks for a host's backup directory. I want to make sure it's there. If it finds it, great. Uh, if it doesn't find it, then it's going to put this message up here. It's going to be BU error, cannot find valid backup directory for host, and it gives you some ideas of why that might be a problem. I had somebody who was using XBT the other day who said that it didn't work, and I was like, well, why? And it could be any number of things. If your host name changes, uh, actually, I don't think changing the host name will affect this at this, at this stage. It may or may not do so, but if the host names don't match, then what's going to happen is, is that when you reboot after the restore process, you're going to create a new home directory for yourself with no data in it. That's how the system will deal with that. And so it, you might get some pretty strange results. So before you run restore, you got to make sure that all of that matches up, like I told you before, when we were going through the actual operation of the thing. So we passed that test and everything's fine. So now uh, 
the uh, BU restore function comes on and it will prompt you to make sure that you want to do this and it gives the the user a message here and lets them know what's going on if they type in anything other than a lowercase y that is the default option and what it'll do is just it will uh, jump over here it'll go all the way down here and it'll run that but if they put in something other than yes then we go on and actually run the uh, restore function so it'll stop yet again it'll say close any running application and press any key to continue and that's so people can do that it's also your last chance to actually get out of this so if you're just playing around with this and you hit Y and then you go oh, I don't really want to do this if you hit control C at this point it'll dump you out of the script so that's a, just a little inside thing there to let you know so now it runs that same rsync command in reverse and we use a which is the uh, archive command and I didn't tell you before what the H command does what that does is it preserves hard links within the home directory uh, it's very rare that somebody might do that but if somebody does set up a hard link now we're talking we're not talking about sim links we're not talking about a link that points to some other file system or some other directory a hard link is where you have a single file uh, a data file with an inode that points to two locations that's what a hard link is it's actually having a file that shows up in two different directories in the file system but it's actually the same file so that preserves those and that is also there if you have things like CYA or time shift backups that needs to be done you have to have that you if you're backing those up with your uh, on your BU drive and some people do that then there are hard links in there for sure and they need to be honored so that's what that does so we delete once again so anything that changed poof it's gone and we get the same progress and we just go back the other direction we're not worrying about ETC here you should not do an automatic restore of ETC that's not a good idea you want to do that one directory at a time or one file at a time if you know what you're doing so then it runs that checks the output of the command to make sure it's okay if everything works the way it's supposed to then what it does it says restoration complete and it syncs the drives and it says now safe to remove the BU drive and restart the computer it is important here that you restart the computer uh, because some of those changes will need that to take effect if that didn't work then you're gonna get an error message and it says BU error rsync exited with errors do not do anything until you actually make sure the BU USB is still plugged in. What can happen sometimes is it takes a little while for these restores to happen and somebody can move the machine or they can bump it and the drive will come out. And what you have at that point, because it crashed halfway through, you have a completely trashed home directory. It looks nothing like the original because only half the stuff is there or a bit of it's there. So you definitely need to run this command again or you're going to have a trash system when you reboot. And uh, then the next thing to do is uh, remount the BU drive by unplugging it and pulling it, putting it back in. Just pull it out, put it back in, and let it remount to make sure that that's working the way it's, it should. Wait a few seconds and then run the BU restore command again. This is without opening any other applications. You have to do that. And then finally, if you just get errors and it's just errors persist, you might have some hardware issues. There could be any reason, and you may have to just do it manually. See, all is not lost. You can still rebuild the system just by dragging and dropping with a file manager or using the rsync command from a terminal or whatever else. So that then it would exit at that point with an error. Exit 1 means it's exiting with errors. Uh, the restoration was canceled. It just exits the script. Next is the help function which is actually quite easy uh, to understand it's a here document which means that uh, we put a block of text in and then we tell the system please print all of the text from this line on down until it gets to this token which is EOF so we use less we direct the here document into the less utility right there and then we have all of that we go all the way down to the bottom and then we get here and there is our end of file token which is usually underscore capital EOF underscore you actually you could use anything you wanted with a here document there but there it is so there's all our functions that get loaded into memory when we fire off the program the next thing is execution first thing it's going to do is it's going to look for 
arguments. The first one that it's looking for is the help argument. In that case, we will run the help function within the script there, and then we will exit. That's what that does. So you run help, and you read it, you hit Q, and then it exits to the prompt. Next, we have the restore function. It runs the drive test first to make sure that we do have the correct drive. Once that is established, then it runs the restore function, and then the exiting happens in the function itself, whether there's an error or not. And then we have it where if it catches any other garbage that you might put in, uh, it's going to tell you that's an invalid argument, and it's going to encourage you to read help. So it's actually quite simple. So if you don't put any argument in there whatsoever, it just goes through and then it starts running uh, what comes down here. First, it, it echoes the name of the program right there. And then what it's going to do is it's going to run that drive test right there. And then it runs the backup. And then once the backup is done, it either exits with or without an error. And that's how the program works. Super simple. So as you can see, this is very different from XBT. XBT was menu-driven, had a lot more functionality in it. So for instance, I removed the functionality in XBT that tries to set up an XBT drive. That only worked with anything under two terabytes that could use an MS-DOS partition. And even then it didn't work with some drives and some people had problems with that. Uh, so that ended up being slightly unreliable and I just decided it would be best with all of the different options out there. I mean, some people want to use GPT, other people want to use this, that, and the other thing that the user should do that themselves. And that way it just takes that off my shoulders that I don't have to run that. The next thing that I took out was the logging function because it was marginally useful and people were like not really paying attention to it or I didn't pay any attention to the log it just seemed to be kind of a nuisance so I went ahead and took that out just to make sure that there was less to break in the system uh, next thing that came out was the menu because when I first introduced XBT it was a menu driven program purely and people kept saying, I would really like to be able to run this just as a command from the terminal. And so I added that functionality in. And when I did, I did it in such a way that if you ran it from a terminal, uh, it would go back to the menu if there was an error. And then somebody said, well, it really shouldn't do that. It should exit to a prompt with an error message if you're in that mode. So when I went back to look at the code to see if I could get that to do that, that's when I realized, no, I need to start over. There's a lot of stuff in here I don't need, and so we just went ahead and took it out. So that is the way I use the program is from a terminal. I just I would type in XBT slash you know backup, you know uh, hyphen hyphen backup dash dash backup whatever you want to call it. That's how I would run it. I never used it from the menu. So there was a lot of overhead in that program and then it was also packaged in a deb package and then you had to deal with all that which made it easy for users to install but there's a lot more that goes into that. See what I'm saying? I wanted a simple tool. My tools are very simple that I use for my own stuff. So that's what I wanted and that's what BU is and that's why I did it that way. XBT was a great learning experience. It had a lot of stuff in there simply because I was learning how to do it at the time and wanted to add the feature to see if I could pull it off. Whether it was useful or not was less important to me than having it in the program. You see what I'm saying? So that's why we've changed. And I hope BU is going to be useful for years to come if you download it yourself. As usual, your feedback is always welcome. Thank you so much for sticking around for the length of this video. I really do appreciate it. Uh, you can check out easylinux.com for more about Linux. You can join the discussion at EasyTalk, and you can be assured that that is free and secure and fun because we, and we're talking about the Easy Linux project, run that thing from the server on down. That is not some big thing like uh, Discord or one of the other services, Reddit or something out there. We never know what's going to happen with those big corporate things, right? No, we run this ourselves. Also, you can give Easy Linux a like on Facebook. If you're a Facebook user, it would be much appreciated. Thank you so much for hanging around. I certainly do appreciate it. Be sure and like and subscribe if you're new to the channel. And we will do this again soon. Thank you.